Hello and welcome to another episode of the Business of Business podcast. I'm your host, Roy. Of course, we are the podcast that brings you a wide variety of guests that can talk about a diverse set of topics. Hopefully, we could point out something that um, you know maybe you haven't uh, heard of before. Or secondly, if you're struggling, something keeping you up at night, we can provide you a great resource to help you with that. Uh, today, we have an awesome guest with us, uh, Jeff Crane. He is the digital director at Kingstar Media, one of North America's top digital marketing video production agencies. He has been in the digital industry for 15 years. He started on the brand side buying digital media for Johnson & Johnson and Coca-Cola. He moved into the performance marketing space in 2013, where he worked for six years buying high volume digital media on a uh, CPA slash CPI slash CPL for a variety of clients. In 2019, he joined Kingstar Media. In total, Jeff has purchased over 200 million worth of digital media. Jeff, thanks for taking time out of your day and uh, being on our show. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Roy. I'm, uh, I was excited and looking forward to speaking with you. Yeah, I know. It's been a long time coming, so I've been excited to get you on here as well. Uh, before we get jump into this, if you don't mind, kind of give us a little bit of your background. You know, what is some, uh, digital media something that you'd always wanted to do or kind of how you found yourself uh, in this space now? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I come from kind of a, a family that was in advertising. My father, he's uh, has his own ad agency. He was always kind of in that production, commercial producing side, uh, a great kind of director in that respect. And I found myself wanting to get into to some sort of advertising or marketing out of university. I worked for a big global agency. I was lucky enough to get on a team there. They thought that it would have a kind of a good fit on the digital side. Again, working kind of on Jonathan Johnson, Coca-Cola, buying digital media for them. Uh, and now fast forward about 12 years, I'm still in the space, still loving it. I think my favorite thing is that it's evolving almost on a daily basis. There's always something new and keeps you engaged and, and excited. Yeah, I mean, lucky for uh, you, there's guys like me that, you know, I, I can't even keep up with a scorecard. If I figured something out today, I'd, I'd already be outdated by the time I wake up in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, and so now you focus mainly on the the performances. I think the way you put it, the performance side, which is purchasing uh, ads or purchasing things that will produce results. Correct. Yeah. So that's kind of where we separate ourselves uh, and and my kind of skill set specifically. I mean, we're not your traditional brand buyer. We're not going to buy for kind of the Fords or the GMs of the world where they're just looking for impressions and awareness. We're actually working with companies that are looking to drive revenue at a certain cost goal. So let's say you come to me with a product that's $100 and you say, Jeff, based on my cost of goods, I can afford to pay $30 to acquire a customer on digital media. I go out and try to acquire that sale with $30 worth of digital media. And then we try to scale it thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, hopefully millions of times. We kind of pride ourselves in if our clients can be successful and we can generate them profit, then they'll reinvest it with us. And it's kind of a, both of us work, both of us win and we can scale together. Yeah. So what, I guess, what platforms does this encompass? Is this more, and it may be a combination, but like, uh, again, I'm coming from a, a very limited knowledge base, but you know, you think about the uh, the Google links or click throughs. You know, like when you do a Google search, somebody shows up at the very top. It's usually paid, but then you have the display ads or display videos. Do, do you all encompass all of these, or do you focus in one one area or the other? Yeah, exactly. So I think certain digital platforms or digital ad networks are better suited for this performance uh, realm of marketing. Google definitely being one, and then Facebook and Instagram uh, being the second. They're both platforms that have tracking that's set up. So you know every person that clicks, if it turned into a sale or if it didn't, uh, that allows you to kind of, let's say it's a keyword bidding strategy where you have a hundred different keywords. How are you going to know which one to cut or which ones to increase the budget on? Well, Google layers in that kind of transactional data. So you're able to see at a keyword level which keyword exactly drove a sale and you're able to make a decision on whether to continue to run it. And if it's profitable for you, then hopefully scale it and, and spend more money. Okay. So if I was to come to you and just say, look, I've, you know, I will take your instance that you said, I've got a product I sell for a hundred dollars. 
product or service of I've got $30 per person, you know, kind of where do we go from there? Is there input questions that I need to answer to help you get started? Yeah, absolutely. So first thing, like you said, understanding kind of your profitability metrics is the most important. After that, we'll speak to you about how you want to position your product. Why is it unique? What are the unique selling propositions? What makes it different than other kind of products or services in that category? Then we formulate creative ideas, how we're going to create a video, how we're going to create images to kind of display that positioning, display why it's such a good product. And then we'll put it into play and ever put those ads on Facebook, on Instagram and on Google uh, and kind of let the consumers decide if it's worth them to buy. And kind of like the, the proof is in the pudding, the okay. data is uh, if the If the clicks are there, if it's driving sales, it's working. If not, we try to iterate. Marketing is like, I can, uh, kind of equate it to uh, a baseball uh, average. 250 or 250 or 300 is a great average. You're going to make millions of dollars in the MLB. Marketing is the same. You're going to swing and miss so many times. You, out of 10 ideas, eight of them are going to fail. Two of them may be successful and you iterate and build from there. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, one thing we try to preach, especially in the marketing space is patience. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit different because I think, well, I'll, I'll ask you, this is a little different because of this paid portion, the paid for performance. And so maybe y'all expect a little bit more upfront, but we always talk about patience that, you know, um, if you throw something out there today and you get big wins off of it tomorrow, the next day, a lot of times you're lucky. It takes time for people to, even if it's a good, uh, a good ad, it just takes time for it to resonate with people unless you just hit, hit the right place where it, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, I need that. Or I've been waiting for that or the price is right. And I'm going to click on it. But uh, talk to a little bit to that point is like, not only the patience of if you get the right ad in place from the beginning, but also kind of that tweaking it if, you know, how you may have to move things around if you don't see success right in the beginning. Totally. Yeah. We're always pivoting. Um, that's probably our favorite word in the advertising in the advertising world. So it's funny, Roy, a lot of times we'll plan for something. Like I've seen the best plans, the best creative. I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be a smash hit. How can this not work? And then you put it out there, nobody clicks, nobody buys, it's a total flop. But listen, you're like, okay, I still know the product's good. I still know that people want it. We did our research, the consumers want this. So how can we reposition this and figure out something that they do, uh, that they're do gonna grasp, something that's gonna engage them. So we typically try to come anytime we launch five to 10 different positionings, different selling propositions, and we'll just test them all. We'll see the response rate. We'll find, okay, these two are working. Let's see how we can iterate these two concepts and, and flush it out. Okay. So now in, in time wise, so what, how, you know, what could a, a buyer or what could your consumer expect from, uh, you know, let's just go from today, you know, I, I kind of walk in the door and, and we agree to move forward. You know, what is the time involved in that planning, but then also to once you place the ad uh, or, you know, the placement or whatever you're doing. So like, how long do you give that first cut uh, a go or do you put like three or four out there at one time to see which one you may be getting some traction on yeah so it's interesting facebook has this really cool ad unit it's called the dynamic ad so let's say that i set up a targeting men 18 to 45 who are interested in cars so that's going to create me an audience of 10 million people great within that targeting now i'm going to create an ad i can add five different headlines five different images five different videos five different body texts and what facebook is going to do is they're going to send it all out and they're going to find the best combination for you for that targeting group so you're going to know roy right away probably after anywhere from three to six hundred dollars media spend you're going to see enough lift to be like okay this has some chance of success uh, let's get away from here if you're trying to build a brand you know maybe it's a longer life cycle a higher cost product something that requires some education perhaps we'll go through the funnel educate them at the top of the funnel then maybe come back to them with a little more down funnel message and then finally bottom of the funnel buy it. So it really depends on the product. Some require like it's a quick intent. Oh, I need that right now. Yeah. Some products are like, okay, I need to educate you about this so you can understand the benefits, then I'll sell it to you. Do, do you notice that usually with price points that, you know, with more uh, things that cost less money, probably the reaction is much quicker than, like you said, maybe higher ticket items or services may uh, just take a little bit longer in that cycle. 
Absolutely, Roy. I think like you said, a product that's maybe 20, 30 or $40, a lot of people can afford that. They can justify that spend. They say, okay, you know what? Um, I haven't bought anything in a while. I haven't been out. This is a quick buy. I really want this. This peak my eye. I'm going to buy it. Something that's maybe kind of in that three, four figure range, that's going to require, oh, you maybe you got to go talk to your wife. Right. You have something you got to buy for your kid. There's more important things to buy. So how am I going to justify the spend? From an advertiser, you have to show them how to justify the spend and why they need it. Yeah, you, you have to show my you have to show my wife why it's necessary. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so um I, the other thing is that um so so something's going pretty good. And I guess, you know, good is measured. Uh, everybody has different standards, but you know, let's say you you're like pretty happy with this. It's getting a lot of traction. So do you like take a secondary idea or secondary keywords and kind of throw out there to see how that works to, you know, cause I guess the, you know, what I'm thinking about is who knows, maybe, you know, 25% is a good click through rate or return rate, but you never know until you try something else, you may get 40, 50 off of that, or you may get five or 10 and have to revert back. Yeah, totally. We're like, I think a lot of the time too, it's about scale, right? So maybe in the first initial campaign, we let's say we sell 500 or a thousand units and things are going great. But now the, uh, the partner comes back and they say, okay, we want a 10 X, a hundred X this revenue. It's interesting. Once you scale the spend, the performance doesn't hold. At that point, when you kind of go that mass market, now you're talking to a lot of different niches, a lot of different conversations. So you have to really tailor the ads and the messages to each one of those niches and develop personas for these buyers. Because like you said, so you're going to get lucky in that first little bit. And you're like, oh my gosh, we have a gold line. And then when you try to expand it to the masses, it doesn't hit or the performance doesn't stay. Okay. So it's all about testing and planning for that. Yeah, and so kind of breaking it down for a novice like me, what you're saying, uh, that initial spin, you know, it, I don't even know what, let's just say we put five or $10,000 out there, we're getting 25, 30%. Right. So what you're saying is I come back and I'm excited and I'm like, okay, now I'm going to throw you 50,000 and you put it out there and you, I guess, do you continue at that 25 or does, when you're saying that it doesn't carry when, um, uh, when we try to expand it, does it actually, do you see that start going down the percentage? It's, it's tough to hold that profitability metrics when you do scale it at such a large uh, pace. So what you have to do is that's where kind of the, the branding becomes really important. important. You have to develop email lists. Our customer use have to be on point. We're going to go to other channels. We're going to add to Amazon. Uh, we're going to make sure Google search is on point. We're going to add maybe Bing. We're going to add go to other ad networks to try to expand the reach on it. Okay. So does what I'm selling, the product or service or my spend, does that determine the channel you go? Or do you always kind of have the, this is the kind of the first path that we're going to go down and see how that works and then, you know, adjust from there. Or if I, depending on if I'm selling a high-end consulting service versus, uh, I don't know, you know, a $25 widget, does that make you say Facebook versus Google versus LinkedIn or something like that? Yeah, so I think it really comes down to, to more of the demographic of the buyer, right, Roy? So think about this. I mean, maybe a 18 to 25-year-old kid, if that's the buyer base, I'm probably going to say, hey, TikTok's is the place to go right now. Yeah. Uh, maybe if it's that kind of uh, mom, the 35 to 45-year-old young mom, a little more affluent, maybe Pinterest is where we're going to go test it. Uh, if it's maybe that 50 to 60-year-old man, Facebook's a great spot for it. So we really just try to figure out where the buyer is, and then we'll select the platform uh, to advertise based on that. So, so have you ever been surprised by the, uh, I guess, the the actual buyers demographics i don't know i'm just thinking i'm selling a product and i've sold a few of them and you know they were like maybe men 30 to 40 years old somewhere in that range so you know i, I assume that you know kind of our at the intake these are questions you're asking me you know what is this product who is it who's buying it and then so have you ever been surprised, like you kind of targeted 30 to 40 year old men, but all of a sudden some other demographic kind of tends to rise to the top? 100%, right. It happens all the time, actually. Uh, we kind of lean on, like you said, the partner or uh, the product person that we're working with to understand their buyer, but oftentimes they don't, or maybe that that buyer was who was buying it in Home Depot or who was buying it 
uh, at the at the local CVS, that online buyer is going to be a different person. Uh, so they kind of assume something, and then once you dig in the data, you're like, oh my gosh, it's actually someone that's 20 years older. They're always on their mobile phone, and this is the type of buyer actually for digital marketing. So I think just based on the platform, go back to just what I said before about TikTok versus Instagram versus Facebook. It's nice. the same kind of thing offline at uh, at kind of retail versus online. It's a completely different buyer. Yeah. So I. It- what if I come to you and just tell you, I have no idea who's buying this thing. You know, I haven't sold a lot of it, but just really haven't had the tools to keep up. Is there a way that you can kind of help them dig in? Or do you basically just have to start with your best guess, looking at the the product or service and saying, well, this looks like a, this demographic and then just shoot it out there and try it. Or do you have some kind of a method that you can help narrow that down? Yeah, we definitely have a method. Uh, we use a lot of surveys. Uh, we kind of have a list uh, of people that have purchased a lot of products before. So we have a long kind of email and consumer list that we can bounce these kind of ideas off of. We'll send a survey to all of them. We'll get some response data. Uh, we'll also look in the market, see kind of similar products and who's buying them. That will give us a good idea. Yeah, and then finally, you know what? We'll give our best guess. We'll say, okay, we think it's between this demographic, uh, this age, it's uh, this gender, and they kind of like this. Then we'll put it out on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes uh, we miss the mark by a little bit, and then we'll just adapt the messaging accordingly. Okay. So um, on the spend, is there a, you know, again, I'm sure it's different for everything, but is there a sweet spot where, you know, somebody comes to you with two, three, four hundred dollars, maybe uh, not enough to really gain the traction, or I mean, even with that amount of money, can you put something out there and kind of get a feel for it? Is there like a minimum amount that it just generally takes to really get things kicked off? Yeah, so we have what we call a, a web test model. Uh, so it ranges between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. That gets you a Shopify store, uh, full production creative. We'll have a, a full day shoot. We'll get you three to seven videos and ten plus images. And then we'll also reserve $10,000 in media spend. Again, that's going right to Facebook or to Google. Okay. That's kind of our starter package, 15 to 20K. We'll get you up online. We'll get you some sales results. And then from there, we'll know, okay, you know what, Roy, uh, you have a chance to be successful. This is our uh, suggestion for the next round. Uh, right away, our goal is to drive you sales from day one. I mean, we have products that we just launched last month that we did 100K in revenue right away. They came to us with that exact same package. Just started with that 15 to 20K test. And we blew it out of the water in the first month. So it can happen. Again, it's kind of like that batting average, but uh, there's definitely success stories at, at that investment. So, and you said, uh, talked about videos. So when, um, what is the, um, you hear a lot about with YouTube being a great place to do how to's. And I know that there are people that uh, on both sides of this, that it's like, well, I don't want to give away too much. And I'm, What I think I've found over the years is sometimes if we give away enough, people realize that I can't, if it's a service or a product that, you know, it's like, well, I can't do this. This guy just showed me how difficult this was to do. And I'm like, because I'm the same way, you know, I watch these YouTube videos and, you know, I I get an idea of whether I can actually perform this or not. Uh, Is that, how does that hold up? Yeah. So we we call it, Roy, in our world, we call it uh, user generated content. UGC is the short form. It works really well on social media because just like you said, people want to resonate with something that they can relate to. Like, okay, I mean, that's a normal person like me. They're, they can do this. They can execute this product. They can use it well. Yeah. Um, so I think those videos work really well on social as opposed to those super salesy, super commercial videos yeah. where you know right away, this is an ad. They're trying to sell me something. Right, right. It really kind of is more relatable. It's more authentic and organic. Yeah. Yeah, and it, you know, we talk about that a lot, or I do. My position on you know blogs and things like that is the more personal you can make it, because when we get down to it, you know, if you're buying a a, a trinket, you know, five or ten dollar item, maybe you don't really have to resonate that much. It's like you know, this is something I need or want and use. I'll get it. But once you start getting to a certain point, is like I need to resonate with this person, and so you know, we always talk about trying to be as personal as you can, you know, you kind of have to keep that line between, you know, too much information, but yet not so stiff because it's, it's just like the internet, you know, I I'm old enough around to was around when the internet was invented. So, you know, back in the day, especially professionals suit and tie, you know, that was your picture 
uh, everything very professional and, you know, kind of stuffy, to be honest. And that's something that's kind of eased up over time is now it's, you know, the jacket, but people with their dogs and things like that. And uh, I think that personal touch can really help resonate with people be like, hey, I like this guy, because typically that's who we buy from is people we identify with or people that we, you know, think we could like. I totally agree with you, Rock. Yeah, it's it's come a long way. Users are getting smarter. They've seen all the ads now. The internet's been around for a while. Like you said, they've seen everything. They're getting more intelligent. So we got to find kind of those organic, authentic ways to to prove that the product or service is worth it. Yeah, and I may be I may not be the typical consumer, but one thing I kind of when I see the polished, slick ads, you know, I tend to kind of shy away from them because I'm like, hmm, what's going on with it? Why do they have to be, why are they overcompensating, I guess? And, you know, that, to be honest, that's kind of the way I like to run the show is not to be overproduced. I just, it just needs to be a casual conversation because what I'm hoping is that the audience, this message resonates with our audience. Somebody hears what you're saying. They're like, hey, I, I like that guy. I think I you know, can trust him and want to work with him. So, you know, I feel like this is the same way when we are placing ads or doing videos. And again, I'll put that as a question to you is that that's kind of where we need to go is not the, not be too polished. I mean, we need to be professional, but there's a definitely a sweet spot in between there. Totally agree. Right. And I think you got to think too about these niches, right? Someone like yourself, who's kind of understands ads more. uh, He's seen it all. He's looking for that authentic organic content. We're going to try to reach you and these ads are going to hit with you. Maybe someone else who's, uh, maybe they're new to the country, they're used to something else. Uh, you don't know who you're going to hit on the internet. And that's the beauty of advertising is trying to create all these videos for millions of people because everyone's different. You and I are different. You and I like different things. Uh, something else is something new is going to make me engage and not make you engage. So it's all about testing and finding those niches and, and targeting them correctly. Yeah. So what are some uh, pleasant surprises? You know, what's what's one that you just, knocked out of the park that you're like i still can't believe that happened yeah so it's funny uh, we my agency and uh my dad there was a product uh that we worked with sham wow uh and the slap <laughs> yeah. i mean we uh, kind of were that dr agency at the start and yeah. he was like this like pseudo celebrity uh he just those first three products he just completely knocked them out of the park and the sham wow was just a sham that, I mean, you and I could go clean our car on a Saturday. We maybe find it at, uh, at the Home Depot and it would be two, five bucks. This guy needed a whole business and a whole brand. Right. Uh, I mean, if, if, if he came to you with that product and you never knew it, you and I would probably both laugh him up. Like, no way this is going to work. Right. But he was such a hard seller. Uh, he was so talented at, at selling it and making it look like such a unique product. And it just took off. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. I haven't thought of that guy in a long. I think he actually passed away if I'm not mistaken. No, he's still around. Oh, he's is still he still around? around? Yeah, he, yeah. He just not has, has involved in advertising anymore. Oh, okay. Interesting. So uh, I guess, you know, as we kind of wrap this up, what are some things that you would recommend not only that people do, but, you know, maybe some information that it, it's helpful to pull together before somebody engages with you before we actually have a sit down? Yeah, so I think that it's the most important thing, Roy, is just understanding your costs. What can you pay to acquire a new customer? You have to understand what your cost of goods are, what you're going to be paying for shipping, uh, what your product cost is, all of these things. Once you have that sorted out, you're going to be so far ahead of the competition. We have people coming to us uh, with no idea about their cost of goods. They don't know what they can pay to acquire a customer. Understanding those metrics is going to set you so far ahead because then that's going to help you determine who to work with, what your budget's going to be, uh, what the life of the product is, it's going to help you uh, twofold. So definitely costing, most important, what can you pay to acquire the customer? Okay. Yeah, and I guess kind of extrapolating that, making sure that we have, uh, I, I guess at some point we're going to probably, um, well, I guess I'll, let, I'll ask you this instead of guessing. Yeah. Like, so do we need to have a good web presence or is that part of, do you build a like kind of like a, off to the side landing page that really has nothing to do with my website where people can just go there, buy it and, and move on. Exactly right. We'll okay. build a completely separate website just for this uh, campaign. 
Okay. Typically, your website, people are going to maybe know the name of it. When you're advertising on Facebook and Instagram, people are just clicking the ad. Very rarely are they going to read the URL and just memorize that .com. We'll create a completely separate siloed website uh, on Shopify. Uh, and then after it's done, you own it, you take it, or you can just pause it and shut it down and just revert back to whatever you had existing. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, that's awesome, Jim. It's been a lot of great information. Before we get away, a couple of things. Number one, you know, is there any other, any last points or uh, comments that you want to make before we wrap up? I think it's just, Roy, first of all, I appreciate uh, you having me on. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And, and second, I mean, there's no bad ideas. Like I said to you, we've seen some of the worst become amazing and some of the some of the best ones never succeed. So yeah. uh, just kind of believe in yourself, understand the costs, and uh, you never know what could happen. Yeah, I never give up. Like I said, it, you know, and you made this point too, is that even if I come to you with what we think is the best laid plans, maybe that just doesn't work the first time. So be prepared to make this like any marketing, make it for the long term. And, you know, if, if you just, if, if you have to have the short bump, you just have to be able to hang on. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't always happen, but just be uh, able, be willing to work through everything to get on the right path. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, do you have a tool or a habit? Is there something that you use in your daily life, professional or personal, that really adds a lot of value? Absolutely. I'm a huge note taker, Roy. And I, I'm like a big to-do list guy. I write everything down every week. I have a to-do list to check it off. Without it, I have no idea where, where it would be. Uh, it's kind of like my reminder. And that is my everyday to-do list, checklist, go through it. And old school, write it down in a notebook, even yeah. though I would say maybe I'm early 30s, kind of old, new generation, but I'm still kind of old school in that regard. No, I know, I've got, I've, yeah. I got my little trusty notebook I keep with me, you know, when we do these. And yeah, it kind of going off of that, uh, you know, the um, there are a couple of note-taking services out there that I've found, I'm trialing right now that are pretty cool, you know, when you're on a, a Zoom call or something like that, because, you know, I talk to a lot of people and sometimes it's like thumbing back through who can be birds. So anyway, I'm, I'm giving these a trial to see, yeah, you know, how it is moving to the digital note taking. Okay, well, let me know what, let me know what you find. If there's anything <laughs> you, know, you have to try it. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it, it, I guess it's here, you know, there's a couple competitors out there, so I think it's probably here to stay, but anyway, yeah, I'll let you know how this goes in a, in a month or so. So, uh, Tell, let's just kind of break it down a little more. So who do you like to work with? How can you help them? And of course, how can they reach out and get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, we like to work with people that are passionate about their, their product or their service. They believe in it. They want to see it through. Like you said, they're going to be persistent. They're willing to work through changes. They understand that they're not going to hit the home run off, off the bat. Um, those are the type of people we like to work with, people that we resonate with and get along with. Uh, but we're open to working with anybody. I mean, we have people from uh, Australia to Hong Kong to the United States, obviously, in Europe. And we're based in Canada, so we work with everybody. Uh, and how they can reach us, you can find us at kingstarmedia.com. Uh, we have the contact form on the website. Fill it out. We'll get back to you right away. Give us a call. The phone number's there. Uh, we're, we work 24-7. We'll always get back to you, and uh, we'd love to see you succeed. Okay, great. Well, Jeff, thanks again for your time, and I, I can't say thank you enough for your patience through this whole, not only for the last month getting you here, but also for getting on here tonight. So thank you so much for that. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Y'all reach out, let Jeff help you uh, put together a plan for your paid media advertising, uh, di paid digital advertising, I should say. And that way, uh, you know, let him help you be successful. That's the best way is, you know, find these experts in this field, let him uh, do his thing. And that way we don't guys like me don't have to overthink it and uh, make all the mistakes that we make trying to do it ourselves. Definitely. All right. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of the business of business podcast. I'm your host, Roy. Of course, you can find us at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com. We're on all the major podcast platforms at um, iTunes, Stitcher, Google, Spotify. We're on all the major social media platforms as well. Probably hang out more on Instagram than anywhere else. Uh, a video of this interview will go up when the episode goes live. So you can check that out on YouTube. Again, we appreciate our audience and uh, we um, just take care of yourself and take care of your business until next time.